They have to work with your community, with your parents, and with your staff to create that trust. Because if that trust is not being built, you're going to be an isolated entity. This episode was originally released under the podcast titled Teaching and Learning Theory versus Practice. This rebooted episode has been migrated to Teaching and Leading with Dr. Amy and Dr. Joy. I am Dr. Amy Viaclia, Director of Educator Preparation. And I am Dr. Joy Patterson, Chief Diversity Officer. Our podcast addresses issues through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with solutions for us to grow as educators. So join us on our journey to become better teachers and leaders. So let's get into it. Good morning, Amy. Hi, Joy. How are you today? I am great today. This is fall, one of my most favorite seasons. I'm looking forward to the leaves changing. Well, I'm already seeing some leaves changing in my remote teaching and learning space right here. Yes. And I'm also looking forward to our next guest speaker. You know, the great thing about this conversation, I think back to how I started my career as a bilingual teacher. I taught science to eighth grade Spanish speaking students in their native language. So that was spectacular for me. I have some ideas, you know, about the joys and challenges of meeting the needs of ELL students and their families, because I think we can't address one without the other. But when we think about the challenges and opportunities in education, a lot of times we've been talking about, we've been talking about equity, curriculum and technology and quality of instruction and all these other resources. But I think the greatest problem that we have is actually a teacher shortage. And the role of The teacher is just central to the entire education enterprise. You know, what can we do without teachers? And the shortage of bilingual and ESL teachers is just simple, greatest barrier. And it's a threat to education. So I just think that there's just so much there to talk about. I'm looking forward to talking to him about some of those barriers, some of the great things he's doing in ESL and bilingual education. and the need for bilingual teachers. You know, at GSU, we actually prepare all of our early childhood teachers to be ESL prepared. So when they graduate from Governor State University, they also graduate with an enforcement in ESL. So we're putting out at least 50, 60 graduates a year that have ESL experience. And we've established these intentional partnerships with schools to have a pipeline between student teaching that will lead to job placement because they have this ESL and bilingual experience. So Amy, I know that you've actually had the opportunity to work with Mr. Garcia in a professional capacity and you have great regard for him. So what would you say before we meet with him are some of his greatest attributes that he brings to the table? Adelphio is a retired administrator, but yet he is going to continue working in the communities, consulting with schools and uh, developing programs for bilingual education. He is leadership team member of the Illinois Writing Project. So that's where we came to know each other. And I always sit in awe whenever he talks about the professional development workshops that he's involved in and that he facilitates. And I'm hoping that I will be able to attend some of his upcoming sessions too. So Adelphio Garcia, uh, being a retired Chicago public schools principal, as I said, he's not stopped working. I'm so looking forward to having him on our show and for our listeners to learn about tips on maintaining educators in the classroom, what they can do to meet the needs of the community. Yeah, another lifelong learner and teacher. I can't wait to meet them. Welcome to our show today. Thank you. Yeah, this this topic is really exciting for me. I started my teaching career in a bilingual program. I was actually the science teacher for eighth grade non-English speaking students. 
and most of my students came from Guatemala and Mexico. I am just really excited to see how things have evolved since that time, because that was a long time ago, let me tell you, a very long time ago. And even though it's evolved so much, it still has its challenges. We know that there's a shortage of people, right? But there's just this persistent shortage of dual language language teachers here in the U.S. You know, some districts I know are still trying to do some short-term fixes by recruiting from other countries. I know we did at our school. We recruited from uh, teachers from other countries, but it was nothing that was ever sustainable. So I guess my first question to you, because with all the other challenges we have, if we don't have teachers, that's our greatest challenge, right? Because that is the most important asset in the classroom. So as an administrator, how are you able to keep up with the demands of qualified ESL and bilingual teachers? Well, it was challenging as you explained, Joy, how difficult that is. As an administrator, um, fortunately, I work for Chicago Public Schools my, the majority of my career. So I have plenty of applicants that qualify for those positions. And um, you just have to make sure that you sell the school well to those applicants because they do have a lot of options within the same Chicago school system. When I mean, what I mean by saying, you know, having your school to be competitive and to be attractive to applicants, it is a one step. I remember back in the 90s, early 80s and early 90s when I started my career, I attended a job fair, and while I was in line, there were principals talking to people in line trying to get you to go to their schools. So at this time, you know, when I became a principal, it wasn't like that. It was mostly that you get a lot of resumes, and human resources will provide those to you, and you call applicants for interview, the ones that would fit or what we were looking for. So it is. It is challenging, but I don't think, you know, having a body in the classroom is a challenging part. As you said, sustainable. To keep a teacher in the classroom, it's much harder than recruiting someone to get into the building. And probably, you know, we get to that a little bit more, but sustaining a candidate that you're going to keep for a long time and developing that teacher takes years. It doesn't take months. I know that you already have a pre-qualification, which is the language that you're looking for, but there are other theoretical aspects and other practical aspects to teaching than only having a person who can deliver the instruction in the, la- in the target language that you're looking for. Right. And that was the challenge we were finding as we were recruiting from outside of the state and outside of the country is that those teachers needed a support system too, but it really wasn't sustainable. So you're, we were constantly replacing teachers. Yeah, that's the most difficult part, you know, sustaining so, uh, a, a teacher because, uh, and, and I'll get to a little bit more about, you know, having how professional development and how finding your identity as an educator provides you with a little bit more of robust understanding of what bilingual, what education is, and especially bilingual education is. Well, tell us a little bit about what shaped you, because you started as a classroom teacher, moved forward into administration, and then done work after retirement, but what shaped you as you moved forward through these different uh, spaces in education? maybe your education, your teaching, community experience? Sure. Let me just start with my educational experience so you understand where I come from. I gave you a little bit that I started back in the late 80s, early 90s, where education, for example, you know, was very different of how it is right now. We didn't have that many instructional strategies for bilingual students being taught in the school when you were attending the university level classes. There weren't that many instructional materials either in the target language that you were actually teaching. So we were left on our own to develop our own materials. So with that, saying that education has evolved greatly. 
For bilingual education was the quickest way to find students is to learn English and then move them into monolingual classes, monolingual English classes. And because of the loss of our state, of our country, requires us to do that. And that is the focus. The only thing that I has not changed is that our loss still remain the same from back from the late 80s, early 90s, up to now. You have to have you have to move students from their bilingualism into the monolingual English classroom. And that is the focus. So education has evolved in terms of creating programs for bilingual students to remain with their heritage language, which is dual language instruction. So it's a segue to say, yes, you're going to learn English, but you're also going to keep your own language and you're going to learn it well, and you're going to learn those equally. And I think that that is most important, you know, having those dual language programs and a, a real bilingual program instead of just an ESL program. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to have that opportunity where I was teaching science in Spanish. My job was not to teach them how to speak English. And of course, I incorporated it, but it was really for them to learn science in a way that they could really, really grow in that content area. But you mentioned CPS earlier, and we know that CPS is the largest education system in Illinois. And they support 110 languages in ESL program, which is just amazing. But because of the numbers, not all of them are bilingual programs. You know, some of them are just ESL programs because they may not have a robust enough of a program in that particular language. But we know that the Hispanic community is the fastest growing community in the U.S. So they have more, it seems like they have more of an opportunity for bilingual programs versus ESL. So if you could talk even more about what are the services of someone in an ESL program would have versus someone in a bilingual program and kind of the difference between what type of educators you would need to support that? Good. Let me just go by the law because that's a big piece and that's what they dictate your funding and your programs and how you're going to be implementing instruction for students because English is not the first language. Okay, so thinking about that, I was in a school with 99.9% .9 Spanish-speaking students. I had a family from Iraq and that was it. And uh, the rest of them, you know, were Spanish speaking students. But when I worked for the Office of Language and Culture in, um, in Chicago Public Schools, I was in charge of the Refugee and Newcomer Program, which houses the students that are new arrivals or refugee students that are coming to the country. And most of those students were placed in schools where there was a space and the principals allowed that to happen. And most of those schools were located in the north side of Chicago, where much greater diversity is being found. So that's where you find a lot of ESL program. So having those refugee students and other students attending that school from other cultures, you don't have the number of students as the law requires for you to have. 19 and more of the same language, then you must provide a bilingual program. If you don't have 19 students, then you must provide an ESL program. And the teacher does not really have to speak the language of the students. So the teacher is credentialed in ESL instruction, being a monolingual teacher. For a bilingual program, then you, will, you must have a bilingual person speaking this the language of the students, and English. So let's think about, you know, that of those students up in the north side of Chicago, where mostly ESL programs are being provided with. So those students are pulled out of the general program, monolingual, given instruction in English to learn as much as they can a language. We're not talking about content. We're just talking about language, vocabulary giving them a little bit more of instruction 
a preview of what they're going to be looking at when they get into a full monolingual English classroom. So that is the goal, to speak English and to learn as much vocabulary as possible so they can be moved into a monolingual English setting. In a bilingual program, if you're in the, which is different, you have to have a bilingual person. And because you have a number of students, which is 19 or more, you're able to provide full bilingual education. But the law requires for you to have three years of instruction and then move them out. So that's a transitional program. So when you look at research and you say three years or less does not really provide a full on learning and understanding of a second language, then we educators have to be a little bit more creative. And that's when the dual language flourished. But that's a different programmatic type of instruction, which it was developed later. But according to the law and based on the law, we need to have ESL and bilingual programs. Thanks for giving the listeners that definition and that overview, because I think that that is really important in setting the tone for the rest of this conversation, because it really brings to mind about maybe some disparities and the challenges that suburban schools may have when you have 15 students or 10 students of another language and not having that opportunity of a full bilingual program that I think is so important. That is correct. Although suburban school districts have been shifting their populations to reflect most like urban areas, in my experience lately, that's what I have seen. A lot of um, major suburban districts, not small districts, but major suburban districts, you are seeing a lot of shifts in population. Yeah, Uh, and that challenge with rural districts as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) Yep. In my beginnings, I worked for this school district where all the students from the the district were bused into one school and that school was known as the bilingual school. The rest of the other schools were left with a population that lived close to the school. But if you were a bilingual student and lived in that specific district, you were Boston yeah. into the bilingual I worked school. in one of those schools in the city. So this was a while ago, you know, on the south yes. side of Chicago, and all of my students were bused, and we had a huge bilingual program, but they were bused to my school, you know, so that we could do all the wraparound services and have a full bilingual program. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yep. And that's how suburban districts are being seen right now. Um, I work with a couple of them that I provide a couple of consulting services, and they are facing the same way. But we're seeing one school having the majority of the bilingual students and the students that are scattered throughout the um, um, suburban district, they are bust in. There are very few, but they're actually clustered together in one place, and they all attend to one school. That's the shifts that I've seen in population. In this particular school that had 70% Latino students, I was working with them on their school improvement plan. So there was a huge push to improve their test scores, of course, but also their parent participation, which was also dismal. And so in doing a walkthrough through the school, I noticed that the secretary and the office assistants were not Spanish speaking. (laughs) So this is the first point of contact. And yet the parents were not able to access their teachers or the administrators because of that language barrier. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about as an administrator, what kind of administrative support in school that are predominantly Latino do you have to have in place in order and some that are not even, you know, predominantly Latino in order to have support for those parents? Because that's a huge part of student achievement is getting their parents involved. I do agree with you completely. As a principal, I was lucky enough to work in a highly populated Mexican community. So all the parents spoke Spanish and some English, multi-generational families lived there, multilingual families lived there. But when I got there, a couple of things needed to be changed. 
things that research says. Your community or your school needs to look like your community. One thing, because the trust, it's a huge thing between parents and school. And if you come to the school and even some Latinx employees disrespect the same Latinx parents that may have an accent, may look different, may not look like they would like them to, to look, they are disrespectful to them. So I worked a lot in trying to accept everyone, everyone's language and culture and identity when they come into the school. So that respect has to be mutual. And because I was able to communicate with the whole community, my parent meetings were actually like about 80 to 100 parents on a weekly basis. So you have to work with your community, with your parents, and with your staff to create that trust. Because if that trust is not being built, you're going to be an isolated entity in the community that may not, or may trust, or may not trust you. And that difficulty, communi- that difficulty in communication can go supersede all the scores and all of these other problems that you may see at a later time. But yes, I mean, as an administrator, you have to make your school welcome to the community. And one of those parts, it's speaking their language, knowing their traditions. Walk around the community, see what's around there. I, I had a lot of teachers that actually say, you know, by, by the time I leave, I just get in my car and leave. And the time I need to come in the morning, I just drive in, get to do my job and go. But they didn't even know what was around the community. I know it's so important. My husband, he retired last year and we lived in that community while he was teaching. And I think it was just so important. We would have kids on Saturday come knock on our door. They were like, can Mr. Brown come out and play? And (laughs) And you know, I mean, that's just super important. And I can find him in the mall or in the store because I could hear his loud mouth talking to parents. And, you know, it's just so important in building that relationship and being able to connect with the parents and having that trust. And you sound like a very practical educator. I know that you're grounded in research, but I like your practicality. And it sounds like you put a lot of things in place, you know, beyond research that work. You can talk about it now or a little later. I just want to hear some of those great practices that you think that a teacher and administrator can put in place for having a really good ESL and bilingual program. Then I'm going to let Amy talk, but I just wanted to get some of that in there <laughs> of, of, of some tips from you. <laughs> okay. So let's say that uh, when I became administrator of this school, the principal of this school, my first day, I stood right at the corner of an L shape where my students come from this side, from the east side, and from the north side, and this, from all the sides of the school. So I was just standing right there, greeting parents, greeting students, right before school. It was crucial time, as one of my bosses said, you know you have a report due at this time, and you know you have a meet, but your community is more important. Your presence, your physical presence, even the saying buenos dias, good morning to a parent, that building and communication goes beyond what you may think. Parents were, you know, I instituted uh, meetings every Thursday because I wanted the community to have a lot more say in that school. So when those meetings came about, so I work with my parent point person because I had to put that person. I opened a classroom to be, or not, not a classroom, it was a space in the basement that it was my parent center. So I collected a lot of things within the school furniture that teachers didn't want, books that they didn't want, and I put them all in there and I had my parents meeting, my parent meetings on every Thursday. I told them that it was their space to come in. My parent person was free to do whatever she needed to do. But one thing that I was able to get from donations and other ways is to get coffee and Mexican bread for the parent. And one parent, you know, you used to tell me, 
Mr. Garcia, I am so alone in my house in the morning that my only way to get out, it's every Thursday to come to the meeting because I see a lot of my friends. So that, you know, tells you a lot. And you talk to the parents and you say, you know, bring your comadre with, bring your friend with, bring your neighbor with. We're going to have coffee. We're going to have a good thing. And then, you know, you provide information to them in their language, at their own, I, I mean, speaking their own traditions and doing their things that they like to do. So when I find out, you know, what my parents like, what they come from, because I live very close to the community. I, I mean, to separate us a couple of, you know, how neighbors in Chicago are. <laughs> you know, one separation is just one big. Right, right. And I live on the other side, like on the other side of the street. Or the tracks, like we say. Yeah. And, but there was a, a city park right in the middle. And when I was walking my dogs, I met the parents of my students. I meet my students on a daily basis. And it was just a lot. But anyway, so in that sense, you know, you communicate with them and you give them what you can provide. Sometimes, you know, parents were very happy just to get bags from or their stuff. So I had vendors actually, you know, say, whatever you can donate to the school, I'll take it. And I had a lot of goodies to raffle on a weekly basis. And that was a big thing for them. But the whole thing was that everything was given in the language that they understand and respect what they had to say. I love it. Those are some good tips, you know, and we'll talk about those tips later. Amy, make sure you get that one good tip is get a dog because a dog is a great conversation starter, right? It just really <laughs> helps. And I know that my parents would fill me up with pan and dosis all the time. So I just had a great appreciation for the candy and bread, uh, which the parents just love to share. So food is another really big one. Those are some great, great tips. We did that, Amy, didn't we, this semester? For the first time, because we're virtual, it became more necessary for us to over-communicate and we have many of our student teachers working with families who do not speak English. And so our first translation was Spanish. And this is the first time our student teachers had to really do this because we're doing things virtually and had to do permission forms in different languages. But then we had to do one in Arabic. So, yep. you know, being yep. able to over communicate so that parents feel included is really important, especially when they are not the majority. You're talking about these different identities, and you've mentioned the concept and the uh, idea of identity a few times. Let's circle back to that idea. What is important about learning one's own and others' identities? Great. So let me just go a little, go back a little bit more about you know what shaped me to become or to gain this identity. So what shaped me? It was learning about you know, the laws and regulations of what bilingual education is all about. So having that under my belt, I knew how the system worked and how to get things done. When I entered my teaching career, I gained tons of experiences. But one thing is that being a newbie in a, in a building, you have to side with your colleagues, with the culture of the school, with the culture of the administration, because that is your first contact. As a brand new teacher, you have to be part of a group and you have to be there. So you have to decide whether it matches your own philosophical standards or whatever. You know, you have to match that. Sometimes we read a lot of research and theories in school, but our schools are buildings and they have identity of their own. So when we get to work in that building, we have to learn that identity. They have to learn about the culture of that school and how things work. So you become part of that group and that shapes your identity. Then you start to be a little bit more uh, experienced in everything. One of those things that I, that I did, it was switching buildings every few years because I wanted to learn from a different school, from a different culture, from a different administrator of how things work. So that pays off later on, but understanding the culture in each building, it's, it's a huge thing because that shapes your identity, your beliefs of how things are done, 
sometimes you have to side with a majority of teachers that may not look like you, and they may not have the interests of the students on their radar. So you have sometimes to be quiet and to understand how things work in order for you to, to move forward. If it is not fitting what you're feeling, then move on to something else. Um, but that shaped my identity. And then my communities, you know, I also understanding how that community in itself worked. For example, I worked in a community that it was first arrival for immigrants. Then I moved to another community that was being gentrified. The identity of those students in that community was so different. They're still Latinx, but still very different. So I learned to navigate both a first arrival to a, as opposed to a person that has a second, third, or fourth generation. That identity is different. So I have to understand and learn all of that. In terms of myself or my identity, what I learned a lot is to be respectful and a lot of humility. But first, respect. I have to respect my students. My students come in many different forms, shapes, colors, shapes, and everything else. So I have to respect the way they talk, the way they act, the way they are, because it is them. I have to respect the parents, their traditions, their languages, their ways. I have to respect the teachers that I work with. I have to respect the staff and ultimately that community. So understanding that respect, it's a big part in education because I cannot come in and impose my thinking to families that have been here forever or whatever. I cannot impose any of that. In being humble to admit things that I do not know everything, but I'm able to learn it because I'm, I'm a person that, you know, can find out things because I love to read. I love to do a lot of things. And I like to find out how I can uh, help somebody. But if I don't know it, I'll be the first one to humbly accept that I don't know everything. So that's the identity that I think, you know, we teachers need to move into buildings with having that respect, because that's what I learned, res having respect and having humility at the same time. It's amazing. You get through your entire education trajectory and it's, you learn so much and I'm seeing that you didn't want to stop. So what called you to continue in education after retiring? Tell us a little about the work that you're doing now in the community and with the schools. Okay. So what happens? We as people, we have a saying in Spanish that you stop learning your dad. So <laughs> having that interpretation of my own traditions and my own language and that. And, and I want to hear you say that in Spanish. <laughs> Si no te mueves, si no te mueves, te mueres, pero en fin. <laughs> okay. Um, so we never, we should never stop learning. At least, you know, something that we learn on TV, if it is oral, you learn it orally, but share it with someone else. Because that stays with you. What you have learned, it stays with you. And that shapes your thinking, that shapes you. But as I was mentioning, you know, what's the good of knowledge? is not shared so what do we get to what, what do we gain out of that nothing we just know it but we don't share it with anybody anyway so all the work that i've been doing is because i do have that knowledge and i want to share it and i consult with a lot of cps schools and suburban districts and i'm also consulting to various book publishing companies and community organizations as well Sometimes it is a paid consulting, sometimes it is not. But what I like about that, it is that my voice is being heard and my contribution, I think, can shape some thinking, especially for those generations that are new and wanted to do a little bit more of what has been done in the past. What I offer is a lot of you know, workshops for parents, for multi-generational families and multilingual families as well but using culturally responsive text because I'm a literacy person. So I'm looking always for text that reflect somehow the culture. 
and the traditions of the people that I'm working with. So what I'm doing with that, it is that bringing to, to them and opening a door to say, you know, your stories are being put in print and putting things in print that may last forever. But also, again, we go come back to what's the good of knowing if we don't share it. So one practice that we should have is to have conversations about themes. So opinions of different, of others, you know, shape our thinking. And that's what we do in the classrooms as a collaborative small group. Or when you do the pair share talk or turn and talk, is that communication, that oral communication that may shape your thinking. So that's the same thing we should do as an adult. And that's what I'm modeling to, to families, to others, while I do about after retirement, because I know I do read a lot. I do work a lot, but it was good to have it if I don't share it. That's a wonderful message for all of us. If you were to point our listeners into specific directions as far as what professionals in the field you lean on or what texts that uh, you have on your bedside table, share those with us. Well, you can see in the background of my house, that's only some collections that I have. But while I was doing my dissertation with families, the, lit- the literature was very minimal for Latinx families. So I had to expand my, uh, my knowledge about that. So I worked with a lot of other professors that pointed to different researchers. But I'm going to mention a few of them that I follow consistently because their work has shaped who I am. So one of them is Guadalupe Valdez. She wrote a book back in the 90s where she spent 10 years in a Latinx community at a border town. And she wanted to know what the daily practices of Mexican families can help in the development of literacy of those students. So she was a researcher out of Harvard and she moved into a barrio, to a, a Latinx community. She made comadres. She made, you know, friends of all of the families. She stayed there with them, learning their daily language practices, their daily activities, because she wanted to know what shaped them and what can be used in education to help them. So that's one of my greatest reads. Mariela Paez is also from Harvard. Her focus is families in early childhood. She's got a few books. But she now is going into a dual language instead of that separation of languages that we usually have in this country, that you speak Spanish in here, and when you come in here, you only speak English. Dual languages is speaking both at the same time, and that's what you do translanguaging. And that's Ofelia Garcia's baby, that she does a lot of translanguaging issues. She brings a lot of how the house and how to get translanguaging in the classroom. Patricia Gandara is another person that I like because she, her focus is language and how it can develop in both ways. And because we're seeing a lot of Latinx students right here being born in the country and they manage both languages at the same time that it becomes one. Kathy Escamilla is another person that she actually came with a framework to teach in a dual language program and to develop both languages equally. So her latest book, it's, it's like a Bible to me. You know, I always consult every time that I needed to do something. I need to consult what she, how she does it, because sometimes every time that I read it, I get a different idea. Another person is Sonia Soltero. She's out of DePaul University, and she's also a dual language person. She has written books for leaders, for teachers, and I think her latest one is going to be about families and community. One of my mentors is Donna Ogle, and Donna Ogle had worked extensively with Guatemala. She's gone to Guatemala. She's learned Spanish. She's given professional development to teachers in Spanish in Guatemala, and she's using all kinds of texts. What I love about her is that when she went to Guatemala the first time, they didn't have a rich book collection like we do have here in the state, but they use other texts, whatever texts they get their hands on she used them 
in order for the teachers to learn how to use text, apply standards, not specifically from books, from other kinds of text. Another person that I like a lot, it is Angela Carrasquillo, Angela Valenzuela, and Ania, uh, Angela Carrasquillo and Angela Valenzuela. Those two, Angela Carrasquillo teaches in Spanish, and she, her focus is teaching a good way to read and learn in Spanish. So that's for early childhood, so the beginning methods of teaching bilingual students in Spanish, and how to get a transfer. That's Beeman and Euro right now, the teaching for biliteracy. Angela Valenzuela is a person that wrote a book about high school students and how using their language to support the English development in that high school. She gives a lot of methods of how to go about it. Marcia Farr, it's another person who also went to Mexico and lived there for 10 years because when she found herself in, in the Chicagoland area in Pilsen, she noticed that a lot of the community was from one specific area from Michoacan, Mexico. So she actually went there and lived there to learn the practices. When she came back, she wrote a couple of books. And what she found out that the language practices of these people were far more richer than people thought about. And she found out that Mexicans come in different shapes. She actually explained in one of her chapters to say, I found Mexicans, blue-eyed, blonde, riding donkeys and horses and working on all of this other, you know, regular stuff like we say campesinos, like people from the field work. So she said, my views of a white, blue-eyed person changed when I saw these people working in the fields with the same one, with the, sa with the other ones. And nobody distinct a blonde person from a Mexican-looking person or an indigenous person. There was no distinction in that. They said, we only have that here in the States. When we look at ethnicities so bad that we actually say, you're black, you're Latino, you're this. So we separate that in our language. So what she found out in what, living in Mexico is that we don't have that difference. But our differences sometimes is just the shade, how dark you are. Or your looks as an indigenous to more Spaniard looking. So those are you know, the people that I actually like and I follow a lot because they do have a lot of interesting things that work with Latinx community. That's amazing. We that. And we love that. We're going to share that with our listeners as well. You have such a great library <laughs> and a lot of references and amazing stories. This was great. Excellent. Well, thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Adios. Okay. Adios. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Teaching and Leading with Dr. Amy and Dr. Joy. Visit our website at govst.edu slash teaching and leading podcast to see the show notes from this episode. We appreciate Governor State University's work behind the scenes to make publishing possible. Stay tuned for more episodes with Dr. Amy and Dr. Joy.